They've won Tonys and Oscars and Emmys and Grammys. There's no red carpet because they're home in their jammies. From Melrose Place to Broadway to Janeway and her crew. Let Seth and James bring all the stars to you. Anywho. They're entertaining everyone, so who's gonna grouse? Just sit right back and you'll hear some tales on Stars in the Hello, everybody. Welcome to Stars in the House. Do not adjust your screens. No, I am not Seth Rudetsky. No, I am not James Wesley. I am Darius DeHaas. I am an actor, singer, concert performer, recording artist, and I have been part of the theater community, community for over 35 years and just thrilled to be here uh, taking over guest hosting duties tonight. I am here as a proud founding member of Black Theatre United, which Seth and James so generously turned the show over to for the month of Black History Month. And uh, we are collecting donations, which you can forward to Stars in the House. You see it on the little line down there scrolling by. And, um, I would just love to state for everyone's knowledge that uh, Black Theatre United focuses on awareness, advocacy, and ad accountability. We uplift the Black creative on and off the stage and strive to connect community. We are celebrating our rich Black theater legacy and history as we continue through our art and voices to protect and illuminate the human condition stand for change, and hand it off for generations to come. Um, we as Black creatives have been on this journey a long time, and um, it can't be overstated that we stand on the shoulders of giants, um, Black uh, creatives, uh, Black artists who have paved the way for us. Um, I, as well as other performers of my generations and later generations stand on the shoulders of such people as Paul Robeson, uh, Sidney Poitier, James Earl Jones, Miss Cicely Tyson, Lena Horne. Um, also more personally, I've counted the shoulders that I've stood upon and have been so inspired by uh, the likes of Andre D. Shields, who I've known since I was a little boy growing up in Chicago when he did hair with my mother actually, back in 1971, uh, Ben Vereen, Gregory Hines, and Carl Anderson. And for those of you who may not uh, immediately be familiar with Carl Anderson, he was Judas in the Jesus Christ Superstar movie, which I watched every Easter Sunday growing up on the south side of Chicago. And speaking of giants, uh, I would like to acknowledge the recent passing this this weekend of the one and only legendary Mr. Douglas Turner Ward. Uh, Mr. Ward was an actor, director, playwright, tr a true Renaissance man and co-founder along with Gerald Crone who actually passed away last year and with Robert Hooks, uh, co-founded the Negro Ensemble Company. Uh, and the Negro Ensemble Company, I think uh, there really wouldn't be Black theater as we know it today. There wouldn't be theater, let's just say that, as we know it today, had it not been for the Black, uh, for the Negro Ensemble Company. Uh, it came out of uh, the uh, Black arts movement. Uh, I think it was erected in like 1967. Um, Mr. Ward had written a couple of plays, Happy Ending, Day of Absence, and wrote a what was perceived as sort of a manifesto um, called um, American Theater for Whites Only. And it was it caused such a sensation and caused such a call to action in terms of how we are represented 
uh, in the American theater that uh, the Negro Ensemble Company was born and so many amazing people have come through it. People like Angela Bassett, Esther Roll, uh, John Amos, um, uh, Sam Jackson, Denzel Washington, Latanya Richardson, Felicia Rashad, the list just goes on and on. He truly is the godfather of us all. I don't think there would be uh, a top dog underdog or uh, a slave play or any of those uh, great uh, um, uh, masterpieces that have moved us forward in terms of the theater canon had it not been for Douglas Turner Ward. Um, they won actually uh, um, a Tony Award in 1973 for their production of The River Niger, written by Joseph Walker and directed by Mr. Ward. Um, they also have brought other productions that received great acclaim, such as Home, and probably most uh, popularly known, A Soldier's Play, written by Charles Fuller, which premiered in 1981, which I saw as a little boy in the, on the south side of Chicago at the Goodman Theater, because um, I believe they took it out on tour after they had uh, run it here in New York. And I saw Denzel Washington and Sam Jackson, uh, and uh, just it was just incredible, it's just incredible. Adolf Caesar, oh my goodness, the amazing Adolf Caesar, who people may know as Mr. from the movie of The Color Purple, uh, or Old Mr., I should say, Old Mr. from The Color Purple. So um, that is um, Mr. Douglas Turner Ward. Um, we cannot thank him enough for what he has given given to us. And in celebration of his legacy, uh, I am happy to bring you Black Male Excellence in the Arts. Uh, I am so thrilled to have the people here that I have with me this evening. Each of these fine gentlemen have forged such a unique and beautiful path in their careers and in their lives and what they've given back to the community. And they have really made a mark, uh, not just in theater, but in movies, in TV, uh, in dance, in concerts. And so with no further ado, I would like to bring on my first guest, um, he is a brilliant actor. Um, his name is Leroy McLean. And Leroy McLean is a British American actor born in Huntingdon, Cambridgeshire, England. He graduated from the Yale School of Drama and you may know him from his work in the Adjustment Bureau, um, The Happy Sad, lovely movie called The Happy Sad from 2013. And um, you might know him from this uh, show called The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, in which he played the character Shy Baldwin. And he is going to be uh, in the new upcoming feature, Respect, which I'm very excited to talk to him about. He has also done extensive stage work on Broadway and across the United States and internationally. There he is with Rachel Weitz. So with no further ado, please let us welcome to Stars in the House, making a Stars in the House debut, Mr. Leroy McLean. Hey. Hello. How are you? <laughs> Good, back together again. Back together again, Donny Hathaway and Roberta Flack. You're gonna get me singing. At the I love that. Interview. I love that you are never more than five seconds away from a, a tune. Yes. Always. Always. Yes. Always. Yes. Always. yes. Well, you're never more than five seconds away from a tune as well. And, and we're <laughs> going to turn the tables on you at some point. We're going to get you to sing one of your 80s songs that you love so much. You know, Leroy is a child of the 80s okay. and uh, just loves he he will walk down the street with his earphones on listening to 80s music until the cows come home. Isn't that right? <laughs> <laughs> fine, yeah, guilt is judged fine. Yes, I can't believe, believe within the first minute 
you've put me on blast and I will never forget you. Thank you. Yes, I'm well, this is actually an expose. It's actually an expose. <laughs> this is really a ruse. No, no, no. I, I, I want people to get to know you a little bit better. And um, let's let's uh, let's talk about your background a bit because you were born in England, as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, but you were raised in the U.S. as well, uh, yeah. and that was in Honolulu, 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 Hawaii. Hawaii. Yes. Yes. When did when did you come to the state? I was uh, an early early teen, and uh, it, was, uh, it was a very interesting time being um, a black kid with a British accent that I couldn't shake even if I wanted to. Um, people didn't really know what to do with me. And uh, it was good because I didn't know what to do with myself either. So <laughs> uh, it, was, it was an amazing, amazing experience. I know there's probably tons of people out there that have you know, been on vacation or what have you to Hawaii, but to live there. Um, yeah, tell me about that because you know we do have a certain image of Hawaii. You know when people, yeah. you know, well, I'm going to vacation in Maui or one of the yeah, great islands Maui. and everything. But yeah. it's, it's a different, it's a different kind of thing when you're actually raised there. I know Bette Midler is from Hawaii as well. I forget. Which, yes, which, yes, uh, she went to she went to uh, IAA High School, IAA High School. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, I went to Moana Lua uh, High School, um, but you know it's I'm, it's not a competition or anything, but. Um, <laughs> Uh, to live, I have never, I've never been, uh, to live in a place where the environment, right, where the earth, the literal earth that you stand on is cherished above everything else, right, is, um, it's arresting. It was absolutely arresting. It, I was, uh, oddly enough, I was a member of a, uh, a Boy Scout troop. Mm -hmm. But uh, the only, the closest troop to me was ran by the uh, uh, Church uh, Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. Huh. The was a, so it was a Mormon, um, and I'm not Mormon. Um, but it was um, it was to to be in the Boy Scouts in Hawaii was amazing because we were out in nature all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. We went. Um, we took a boat uh, to the Big Island to that, and uh, did this. I still remember this hike. It was. Uh, it felt like it was. I don't know, a thousand miles, but probably closer to like you know. <laughs> but um, to experience, I'd never walked on. You know, um, obviously cooled and dried lava, which is kind of like walking on glass. It's really interesting. Huh. Um, or to you know scale up a side of a hill made of Pele's tears, which is actually um, like these little pebbles, right? That are that are formed by uh, lava, and mm -hmm. uh, and it just creates. I don't know, just just to walk through uh, such a landscape with that amount of history, but more than more than just the history that's connected it to, connected to it, it's the it's the it, it's cherished it's um it's exalted right and so mm -hmm. everything you do is in respect to that which is why you know you're not supposed to bring rocks shells anything back to the mainland from hawaii it's mm -hmm. supposed, it's supposed to be there so so to go from the uk to uh to that environment, I mean, you—they're you, almost polar opposites, right? And so it just taught me, it taught me a lot about respect for your natural surroundings. And the, you, sorry, and I was just—I was going to say this is also reflected also in in the people, in, in you know the people that call Hawaii home. Um, there is just a, a they have deep roots. And it's just a very kind of centered, relaxed culture, which for somebody like me, who tends to be quite, as you know, um, <laughs> I could be emotional at times. It's 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 what I try to tap into anytime mm -hmm. you know New York life uh, starts to drive me insane. But tell me something, because I, I want to focus because you you moved to Hawaii when you were fourteen, and everything that you're talking about in terms of 
sort of really communing with nature and getting back mm -hmm. to nature and, you know, and being in this pandemic time where there was like a grand exodus out of New York, yeah. uh, <laughs> where, <laughs> you know, where I am, where we both are both and, yeah. um, to, um, you know, get, you know, out of that, you know, viral, um, uh, environment, so to speak, right. and just to be more respectful of nature, uh, exactly. to be with nature, so to speak. You do you think it. that, do you think that informed your life as an actor? What drew you to the life of an actor? You know, it's interesting being, I never ever wanted or thought about being an actor at all mm -hmm. until college. And um, I had my, you know, I'm a very methodical person, as you know. Mm -hmm. um, the way I work is just very methodical. So I had my, I had everything planned out. Mm -hmm. I was gonna, you know, I was gonna go to, I was gonna get um, my JD, and then I was gonna go to, you know, Harvard School of Government um, mm -hmm. for public policy, and then I was going to be a diplomat. I was gonna take the civil oh. service exam, and I was gonna be a diplomat. Um, I, <laughs> I can clearly see you being a diplomat. Right, I'd like mm -hmm. I'd like to think so, um, but uh, my roommate, uh, my first roommate in college, uh, he was an actor, and uh, I had no idea why he would waste his parents' money like that. That's literally what I said to him. It's like, oh, so you're here to major in theater to waste your parents' money, right? That's that's the mindset I had because I was just very kind of you know. Uh, you know, n not that. I well, you were on that. another track at the time. Exactly, and so, but then, all of his friends became my friends, and I found myself watching all of their productions, sometimes multiple times. And I, I could not, I could not. Uh, when people would ask me, you know, why are you seeing this production of The Nerd um, for the fifth time? It's a Larry Shue play. Yes. Know. Oh, you do? Okay. Of, of course you know it. Um, yes, I, I know the number. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so my, my roommate my roommate was in uh, a student-run uh, theater production of that. I think I saw every single, I saw, I think I saw five out of the six shows that week. And I just, I couldn't, I just had to keep going back. And I, I couldn't mm. tell, there was just something magic about his transformation. I knew who, you know, I, I, slept in the same room with the guy, so I knew who he was, but then I'd see him and he transformed into this other thing. And uh, it was it was just amazing. I mean, I'd, I'd grown up always loving, uh, watch a lot of TV, a lot of film, uh, a lot of movie musicals, um, but I never wanted to do it. And so long story short, I just started watch, I just started hanging out with that crew a lot more, you know, the, mm -hmm. the actors and then you know, I still graduated political science and all that, but my heart and everything extracurricular at that point, it was all theater, it was all acting. And then I came to graduation and I decided to take a year off and I worked as a paralegal. And I realized after what, two or three months, I couldn't, I just couldn't do it. And so I auditioned for uh, Yale and I said, you know, if I get in, that means I'm meant to follow this path. If I don't get in, I'll go to law school, I'll do, you know, I'll do um, the diplomacy route. And I got in and here I am. And here you are. Well, mm -hmm. isn't that something because you went to Yale and then you graduated from Yale and graduated with some lovely people like Zainab Ja, I believe, and maybe Lupita Nyong'o perhaps. Lupita, Lupita, we weren't in the same year, but she's, uh, she was, she was, like a cycle after me. So she was like three three years after me. But oh, okay. I, I, okay. I do know Lupita very, very well. And she's Okay. Well, I'm, the reason I want to bring that because you you obviously in in terms of how you communed with nature and how you communed with actors, mm -hmm. uh, because there is a, a visceral thing that one gets as as an actor when you can wrap your soul and spirit around a great monologue or a great play or a great piece right. of dialogue or a yeah. great character. And you yeah. have performed a great many classical roles, uh, roles in new plays, uh, uh, roles from the canon of August Wilson, Shakespeare, you've yeah. done Lorraine Hansberry. Uh, I mean, we, we, are we are giving 
homage and tribute to Douglas Turner Ward, um, who- I have something to say about that. Please. The, the, second, the second show I was ever in was A Day of Absence. Ah. The time I'd ever stepped foot on a stage was as Clem in A uh, Day of Absence. My goodness. Yeah. My goodness. So look at look at that. So I I uh I loved I had no I had no idea that play existed. I I didn't I remember when I when I was asked to do it, basically because there were like two black people that were even anywhere in the circle of mm -hmm. the theater. Uh and, and undergrad. Um I read it and I was like, this this is this is amazing. I, I uh, I'll never forget that. I'll never forget reading that reading that play for the first time and being so incredibly excited uh, to take part. So I, oh. I owe him a lot. Yes, yes. Well, thank you for that. That and I love that you did the Day of Absence. So you you have a great friendship uh, working relationship with Liesl Tommy. Mm. Um, and Liesl Tommy, for people who may not be as familiar, is a fantastic director, um, uh, black female director, uh, born in South Africa. Um, but she, uh, I think, is one of very few, I can count very few black female directors. Uh, I'd probably count them all on one hand in terms mm -hmm. of uh, on Broadway. I mean, there's Liesl, there is Vinette Carroll, who uh, directed shows like uh, Don't Bother Me, I Can't Cope and Your Arms Too Short to Box with God. Uh, if there's anyone else who can shout out a black female director on Broadway, please put it in the chat. You know, just maybe my brain is- Debbie cool. Allen directed. Didn't, didn't Debbie Allen direct Cat on a Hot Tin Roof? Yes, she right. did. Yeah. She directed Cat on a Hot Tin Roof with Felicia and James yeah. L. Jones and Anthony Rose. There you go, Debbie yeah. Allen. Yes, Leroy, yes, call out, call it out. But I, I wanna know about your process. Well, you you, you 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 seem to be one of her go-tos. How did you meet and how is it you've been able to develop such a diverse repertoire with her over time? Cause you did Boy Willie in Piano Lesson with her and yeah. Raisin in the Sun, I believe mm -hmm. with her. There you go. Um, yeah, and, and Hamlet, she picked me to- And uh, Hamlet. Yeah. Hamlet, there you are with Miss John. With Zeno, yeah. Yes. And, hold, so, and, and Yorick, the skull, yeah. Yeah, so so <laughs> tell me just, you know, briefly about, you know, what, how you met and how you've been able to develop such a great- Yeah, Liesl, um, she was, uh, she developed this play called The Good Negro by Tracy Scott Wilson, who yes. is also the screenwriter for Respect. Um, which we'll get to, but um, so that that play was in a very long development process. You know, you know, you know how that goes. Like multiple readings, multiple venues, and so she brought me on to play this uh, to read this character Rutherford, who is a European raised uh, black man that was part of um, uh, it's a, like a Martin Luther King figure, right, uh, mm -hmm. in in the sixties, and Bill Rutherford was an actual person. Um, and so, you know, he was very well-spoken and very, you know, dapper debonair. So of course, you know, she found out about me and then uh, she kept me along. You know, I didn't, I didn't get dropped from the production. So, you know, you just, we kind of learned pretty early on that we approach theater and approach text very similarly. We, we, we think we're, we're just very, very similar in the, in the way that we, that we view the world actually, um, but specifically when it comes to literature, um, the theater, there's just, she has this um, this love for language, right? Mm -hmm. Language language being tantamount. And so, and I, I've always felt that way too. Um, yeah. I remember the first time I ever studied Shakespeare in, uh, it was in junior high, I think we read uh, the Scottish play. And I was just, I've always loved the words I don't know why. I just love them. Love the way they sound. Like how you can manipulate them to, to to do um, whatever you want. So, I think thankfully, uh, in her mind, when it came to these, she's often tasked to direct at least for the theater these humongous, epic <laughs> plays, right? Which involve a lot of dialogue and a lot of intense, complex um, emotion. And so. Um, she has blessed me with being able to play, as you said. Um, I mean, you you line up, you put August Wilson, 
next to Lorraine Hansberry, next to Shakespeare. There is a very clear line, a through line, at least in my head, that, that connects these. And it's, it's, it's the power in the word. It's, I mean, you, you do, if you're ever blessed to be able to play Walter Lee Younger, um, you don't have to do the work. I mean, the work is there, right? Mm -hmm. It's in the language. And so it just, it requires an intense commitment to it. And, and you got to put yourself into it to, to just kind of unpack it. And we just kind of like working uh, in the same, in the same way. She's, she, you have to, it's like running a marathon when you work with her, you feel absolutely exhausted. Um, <laughs> but it is, it's the, Best, I would swear if I if I if I couldn't, it's the best blank feeling in the world working with her. Uh, so yeah, she's just now she's like one of my best friends. So yay! Yeah. So I'm gonna wrap up our segment, um, but you know I I think I would be remiss if I did not at least toss out a nugget of a show that you make quite a sensation in uh, from Amazon Prime called The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Oh, yeah. We have a little, we have a little clip of that uh, to show some of your acting on that. Probably not gonna happen. It might. Di, are you here? Don't talk to strangers. Isn't that what your mama tells you? No one has to know. We could have everything. I don't understand. Your face is a mess. What kind of girl could have done this to you? Oh, honey. Oh. Let the world do what it does. You're safe with me because I love you. My name is Dwayne. You're going to be just fine, Dwayne. No one but you. What's the matter? I'm not that bad. Yay! Who's that guy that keeps doing that singing thing? Oh, I don't know. Some you guy they put on the my screen. Yeah, you know, some guy. <laughs> the my goodness. Well, I I have to say, it was such an amazing experience working on that show, working with you, uh, working on the development of that character. And I want to get back to it maybe a little bit later in in this broadcast. But I just want to ask you one quick question about Shy. Baldwin, we're, you know, he's someone, you know, we're in the 50s, early 60s uh, when we last saw him uh, with yeah. Mitch. Uh, what do you think Shy would be doing now? Well, um, I think, I would like to think, no, I'm going to declare, I think that Shy is living in Palm Springs. I think he's got a couple dogs throwing a cat. I think he's got <laughs> I think he's got an amazing, amazing um, partner that he's been with for years that is now for the last eight has been his husband legally and officially. And uh, I think he thinks back on those days, those really harsh, um, dark days for him. Uh, when he couldn't be himself, I think he looks at those as not so much uh, painful memories, but of uh, growth and of beauty. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, good. So he survives. I He's think so. Don't you? Living. Don't you? Yes. I mean, you're I kind of. Can so. we just, can we, I know you have to go, but I just want to say because you, you brought up something really great about community, and it's actually as as kind of like a thread, right? That kind of. For me personally, right, yeah. uh, meeting with nature, theater being something of, uh, mm -hmm. an acting being a communal experience. I would also like to say, uh, w working on this character with you, and I think one of the reasons that you and I get along so well, even though we can't stand each other, is because you know. is that communal spirit, right? It's that communal mm -hmm. spirit. We work together on this character to yeah. create him. And I just have to say that that, for me is at least 43% of the fun that I have <laughs> with uh, playing that character. 43%, that's very, 43%. very specific. I think that, yeah, it's not quite a, it's not quite a majority, but it's, it's, it's getting there. So 43%, oh, okay. I'm calling it, I'm calling it. Well, 
<laughs> I, I just have to say it was my honor and I would work with you anytime, any, any, Same. yes. Absolutely. So will you hang up for me, please? Yeah, absolutely. Be wonderful. Sure. I'm going to bring you back Thank at the you. end, say a little, have a little round table, but All right. thank you so much for joining me, Mr. McLean. Oh, of course. And I will see you very, very soon. All right, man. Yay. Mr. Leroy McLean. So my next guest is, he is just sunshine and light uh, and just a spark plug. Spark plug is what I want to say. Jared Grimes is a quadruple threat in the world of the arts where he is heavily making his mark in singing, dancing, acting, and choreographing. On numerous occasions, he has danced alongside legends such as Wynton Marsalis, Gregory Hines, Ben Vereen, Jerry Lewis, Fayard Nicholas, and also performed for Barack Obama and Ted Kennedy at the Kennedy Center. Uh, I first saw Jared in After Midnight on Broadway where he just electrified the audience. And I looked at that stage and went, who is that? Um, we have a little clip uh, to show you of him before we bring him on. <laughs> Yes, Jared Grimes, come on out here, please. <laughs> come on, In come on, Jared Grimes. <laughs> <laughs> Why am I screaming? We are here. We <laughs> you just bring here. it out of me. You just bring it out of me. You know, I, 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 I have to say is what I was saying in your introduction. I, I, you know, when I saw After Midnight the first time with you and Fantasia and all hey. those beautiful, beautiful black people up there on that stage and you came in on stage and, and I had that moment in the theater where I was like, who is that? <laughs> who is that? Because it, it wasn't just the dancing. It is an energy that you have. It's a fully enveloping, encompassing energy that you have. And when I see you and, you know, and, and look, you can correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm just going crazy, but I see you in that line of great performers who have contributed so much to the art form, uh, not just tap, but singing and acting as well. I mean, I, I, I think of Sammy Davis and, and, mm -hmm. and Gregory Hines and Harold Nicholas, uh, and um, and Honey Coles, uh, I, I mean, do you do you, when you were coming up and and first getting into dancing, did you think about those things? Was it just something that kind of naturally happened? Uh, because it also seems very natural. You are a very natural guy. So tell me, tell me what what is that? First, thank you so much. Glad to be here, rocking with you, Dee Dee Hoss. Let's go. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, Man, uh, growing up, uh, as I was just, I'm a big film fanatic. Um, I think from an early age, I was just up all night watching movies, anything I could actually find, uh, particularly uh, like three and four. Um, uh, so I would watch The Three Stooges. I would watch Buster <laughs> Keaton. Um, I would watch Jerry Lewis, all the cartoons, like Disney cartoons. Um, and uh, I would stay up late and I would I would wait for those to come on because they seem to come on like like we as i guess not that many people were like watching us there but i was mm -hmm. and um if you if you stayed up and you you know you were on tv that late um all the classic movies came on the the stormy weathers um and just the all the fred astaire movies um you know the robin of the seven hoods with sammy davis jr and i just started this um that were tap dancing um and they were singing and they were acting so um you know I would then start to figure out who these performers were in the movies because you barely even saw their names in the credits or or a lot of the time their scenes were cut out. So um, I began asking my parents um, and various teachers um, scenes with, you know, these performers. Um, so at first it started off with, you know, performers like Bill Robinson and John Bubbles. Um, and then, you know, my teachers just started like giving me these VHS tapes with uh, a whole bunch of like different performances cut from movies and live performances. Tab dancers, Sandman Sims, Bunny Briggs, Baby Lawrence, 
you know, Jenny Lagan, uh, like I said, Buck and Bubbles, the Berry Brothers, the Nichols Brothers, Honey Coles, you know the what I mean? Line. Chuck Green, Lon Chaney. Like, there's a lot of people that people have no idea about that I was just studying from an early, you know, they were rock stars to me. Um, yeah. Just the fact that they were on VHS tape, um, you know, my mind, even a, a two minute, you know, tap routine in a movie or a two minute tap interview um, where they were interviewing these guys, I thought they were these rock stars, these big film stars. And so I just, I began to, like I said, the, the one thing that they all did was everything. Yes. <laughs> so yes. I wanted to be just like them. Um, I wanted to sing, I wanted to dance, I wanted to act, I wanted to be, you know, um, you know, charismatic and funny like they were too. And so I just, you know, I, I am a product of what I, I absorbed at an early age and those um and that's kind of, you know, what's opened up a lot of doors for me today. And your mother is a performer as well, right? I believe you had told me that she had done the Wiz movie. Is am I wrong? Uh no, she a lot of her friends were in the in, in the Wiz movie. She um she actually uh did like that to teach. Um so so while a lot of her friends were going to the cattle call auditions and concert dance auditions, you know, in the eighties and stuff like that, um, you know, she was raising me and as, as well as, um, you know, she had her own dance company called the Sunshine Dance Company. So um, she was really a school teacher. She's taught every uh, level of school, every grade of school, and um, also a dance teacher. And she taught, you know, every genre of dance, except tap was the one that she hated the most. So tap was like, like her arts you know, I mean, um, so so funny that uh, you know, I came up, you know, with tap being my uh my first love. So and she taught me what, so what she did she do? Would she scoot you off to another teacher saying, "Look, I I want yeah. to do the tap." <laughs> she taught me. She taught me what Around. she could. Like she gave me. She gave me the basics. You know, she gave me the basics. And then once I started to, you know, eat that stuff up, then she would like, you know, shuffle me on to a uh, the teacher, and I would just grab grab little tidbits from each teacher. Um, because you know, obviously, tap was not something that everybody was proficient in, you know, at the time when I was a, uh, a little kid. So they, whatever they knew, they would give it to me. I would take it, then I'll move on to the next teacher. Whatever they knew, then I'll move on to the next teacher until I got a little bit older and I was able to kind of actually take the movies that I was watching as a younger kid and actually start to pull the steps from those movies. So as a young kid, you know, I was dancing around and I thought it was cool. But then actually, as I got older, my brain, you know, I could kind of make the connection between the things that my mom and various teachers had taught me to what I was seeing in those old movies. So then I would dive back into those old films, uh, clips from those old movies, and I would start to teach myself some of the more advanced, more aggressive uh, um, dance moves. So by the time I turned like six or seven, I was already, I was wilding, man. I was wilding, man. I was doing everything that you could see in those movies, so. What I find so interesting is that, you know, it's like, uh, not not to throw it back on me, but th this is me. I was the kid sitting up in the room listening to all the records and trying to emulate and trying to learn how 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 did they sing that? How did they sing that? How did they do that? How, and I would reenact things mm -hmm. that I would see in the theater and and in movies and stuff. So I am just totally eating this up because I so relate to that. And and yeah. what I but what I think is so interesting about you or about anyone who really studies the craft or how they come to it. It's just like what Leroy was talking about earlier, just in sort of kind of a communing sort of mm -hmm. thing and how you're drawn to it. Mm -hmm. But there's just this quality that you have that I don't think can be taught, but but you were but you had said something early on is uh, you said I wanted to learn the movies and everything, but also how charismatic they were. And how mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and and you have cultivated by way of you know however you've done it this great charisma that, uh, mm -hmm. uh, that really envelops and draws people to you and makes people want to put you in so many different settings because you of course are this monster dancer, but you are this monster performer. You are this fantastic actor. You are this fantastic singer. Mm -hmm. I saw you at Birdland um, <laughs> a couple of years ago after you had, had done your choreography, maybe directing duties for a new version of 42nd Street. Am I right? 
Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Tamara Tooney, who is also a Black Theater United hey. um, founding yeah. member. Um, and but that performance that you did that night, it it was it was so what it was what I like because it seemed like there was, you know, there was this very natural, very easy going with the flow sort of thing, but you just had us at every moment. There was no <laughs> air that was leaking out of, you know, we you had us wrapped. And then you sort of did this a uh, tribute to Sammy Davis doing Mr. Bojangles and you interpolated some of his moves, but then it was your stuff as well. And I said, this, this is an artist. This is, this is a beautiful artist who is just realizing paying homage, but also bringing his thing to it as well. Um, did you, no, you always wanted to do that sort of performing as well, or was that something that just kind of? Um, I, I, I did. Uh, uh, I didn't. I did, and that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, having your own band and you know musicians that you know believe in the same you know goal and music that you do. Um, I, I mean, I, I like I said, I'd seen Sammy and Buddy Rich and you know, all of the tap dancers that I grew up watching. I, I, I've seen them do like everything, um, and. You know, I studied those clips. I studied those tapes. I studied their interviews. I studied the way they talked. Um, I studied their comedic timing. Um, everything on those guys just by like watching the film. Um, and I, I, as I got older, it just you know you start to you know mature. You know what I'm saying? You start to figure out who you are a little bit. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I, then I started to pour you know dose into all of those those lessons I was taught from the TV screen. Yeah. Um, and it's funny because a lot of people are like, well, who are your teachers? And I used to make this joke. I'd be like, well, they're all dead. Like they've all, <laughs> they've all been dead for, for years. I was like, you, you know where you can find them. You can find them at the library or you can find them on YouTube. Um, you know, for those integral, uh, or those, uh, those, those African-American male teachers who had such a, a strong impact on me, they were all dead. Um, and so, yeah, I just, I just. I saw what they did. I saw that they each individually had their own type of light. And that was something I picked up on. And that was probably the one thing when watching those things uh, and practicing, that was the one thing I really couldn't like emulate. Like I couldn't imitate their light. It was a very specific thing. And um, I learned that very quickly. And um, you know, it was frustrating for a while to figure it out. And I, like I said, as I started to grow up and I started to mature, you know, I, I realized that you can't imitate somebody else's light. You have your own light. Absolutely. for uh, a particular reason uh and that reason is why you've been put here on this earth and um you know me what that was what that light was for me in particular um you know the first thing i said to myself is i, I want to give i want to give it to somebody mm. um because mm. I, i've always i've always been this 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 energetic you know uh young man and um you know, part of that was kind of like my light. And I, you know, I used it all for myself early on when I was an only kid growing up and there was nobody to like actually bounce it off of or, or share it with. And as soon as like, you know, my world began to open up relationships, friendships, um, mentorships, um, you know, professional relationships, bosses, you know, um, people who, who were your fellow employees, fellow castmates and stuff like that. Once I started to, you know, be immersed in, you know, more of a, a social world, I was like, oh man, you know, Darius, this light, or, you know, let me, let me, let me give like Winton some of this light, or, you know, let me give Debbie, you know, some of this light, or let me give some of my, my castmates currently, wow. you know, some of this, some of this light. And, um, it just, I, I became obsessed with it. Like, wow. and, and it's not something I like actually wake up and just be just out of habit. Um, it, it just, I just instantly, as soon as I come in contact with you, whether it's virtually or whether it's in person, I immediately start giving um, some of that light. Um, and, uh, you know, the reward that I get from that, that person smiling or that, that person becoming happy or that person, you know, uh, ch changing for the better in, in some way or realizing, you know, something that they have taken gr for granted about themselves before that or for granted about somebody mm -hmm. else or anything else before that. And um, I really think it's, it's a part of helping um, somebody else um, that makes me evolve and makes my light grow stronger. Um, and that's kind of, you know, what I've always been about since I could 
remember remember or that I had a particular light that I could not imitate from yeah. you know the goats, the icons that I that I idolized. Um, and you know, moving forward, I was just like, okay, cool. Once I step in a room, you know, let's 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 you get it going. Your, let's get it started. Well, you know, that's you know, it, and that's it's, it's, your, it's, that's it's, your it makes inner, me tingly inside. Too, yeah, so. he's bringing <laughs> and and it's infectious and beautiful. I just want to bring up a couple of very quick things because you were managed to bring that light not only to the stage but to the uh, screen uh, mm -hmm. and uh, you are a star of the show Manifest um, which I think <laughs> a couple of stills here um, and, hey. and yeah, hey, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you were telling me in the sound check that you even got the casting director to take one of your dance classes <laughs> 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 I think it's marvelous. Oh, I did. I you also did. brought your light to uh, the revival of a soldier's play, and we are um, celebrating the legacy of Douglas Turner Ward, who was the original hey. director of the show for Negro Ensemble Company back in 1981. Mm -hmm. This was the revival mm -hmm. with you and Blair Underwood, uh, directed by Kenny Leon, another founder of Black Theater United. <laughs> See, you can't get away from us, you can't get away from Those us. My guys, forever. Yeah, mm -hmm. so you've been able to bring it into all these different um, uh, mediums and, and into different sort of genres. Um, and and you are also passing it on uh, um, with uh, what you are directing and choreographing now with this production of After Midnight that you're doing at the Signature Theater out in D.C. as we as we speak, yes, right? Are you in tech. Yes. Uh, well, we're in our third week here, so we'll we'll be oh. in tech very soon. Um, having a great time. It's a ball to celebrate Duke Ellington and Langston Hughes. Yeah. Um, you know, in, in our own way out here. So um yeah, man, my directorial debut. So I'm like, yes. but it's a good, it's a good, it's a good first one uh because of uh my journey with it uh yeah off Broadway and then on Broadway and um you know given my relationship with with Marsalis. Yes. Um you know uh, who I always always go to for information and um guy that uh um been having a ball out here the cast the cast is yeah I know you got the little who I love, who I just love. Oh, Cousin Philip, yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to ask you to hang out, Mr. Grimes, because I'm going to bring in your co-star from A Soldier's Play. Uh, hey. You know, the, the very one. Oh, and we have a couple of donations, which I'm going to read in a moment. But, uh, but thank you for joining us. Please hang out. We're going to bring thank you right you. at the very, very end, and we're going to wrap this all up with uh, our round table. Thank you, Jerry. Sure. Thank you, man. Have a good one. Tell BU I said what's up. I will. I will. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have uh, from Seattle, Susie Q in Southern California, $20. Um, she says, thanks for hosting these Black Theater United discussions. I'm learning so much about the Black experience in theater and new to me artists that I look forward to seeing when Broadway opens again. Well, thank you. Oh, we all, and then we also have $50 from Katie. Thank you very much, Katie. Thank you very much, Susie Q in Southern California. And also Susan and Mona have donated $25. This is an honor of all those who work so hard to truly keep the show going. Thank you to these fierce role models. May you soon have many more people of color sharing their talents alongside you. Thank you so much, Susan and Mona. Yes, let's keep shining that light and let's Please keep giving light as Jared Grimes so beautifully demonstrated. All right, so I am going to bring on this true giant, a true multi-hyphenate, Blair Underwood, is enjoying success in film, television, and theater as an actor, director, and producer. Underwood recently returned to Broadway starring opposite David Allen Greer in the Pulitzer Prize winning drama Soldier's Play for director Kenny Leon and the Roundabout Theater Company. And there he is with Jerry O'Connell. 
Uh, also recently, Underwood starred opposite Octavia Spencer and Tiffany Haddish in Netflix's highly anticipated limited series, Self Made, inspired by the life of Madam C.J. Walker. And he also co-starred last year, I saw it, in Justin Simeon's Bad Hair, uh, which premiered at the 2020 Sundance Film Festival, and which also co-starred Miss Vanessa Williams, who is also a founder of Black Theatre United. So with no further ado, let us bring on Mr. Blair. Underwood. Darius, hey. what's up, oh, man? How are you doing? I'm doing great. Let me just say, Darius, you're killing it. The guest hosting gig, you're killing it. <laughs> <laughs> what your thing, man? Thank you. I'm juggling as fast as I can. No, but you're juggling. It's working. It's working. <laughs> well, thank you for joining us. Uh, it it is such a pleasure, and 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 I um I know you have been in this game for a long, long time, and you've I'm given an old man. I'm an old man. Yeah, no, 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 no. no. Don't admit it. No, you, but you look good. You look good, Blair. <laughs> well, thank you, sir. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. And you have given us such great performances in film and TV, but you also have seemingly made a very conscientious effort to come back to the theater. Uh, and you have given us such great performances in Streetcar Named Desire with Nicole Ari Parker and and my lovely Daphne Daphne Rubin Vega and the legendary Carmen de la I saw you in Pearly at Encores. Wow. Um, and and of course a soldier's play this past season. So I, I just want to know what guides your decisions as an actor and 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 yeah, what guides your decisions yeah. as an actor? Well, first of all, you know, I started doing theater in uh Petersburg, Virginia. Really, I mean, Marie Manigo was my English teacher, but she also had her, her own theater downtown Petersburg, Virginia. So I started doing that and then doing local dinner theaters in Richmond, Virginia. Huh. Um, and my first love has always been the theater. So whenever I can get on the stage and the boards, I'm gonna go there. So uh, then I went to Carnegie Mellon and studied music theater, actually. Um, and that really? was, yeah, I was doing Finney's Rainbow at the time at Swift Creek Mill Playhouse outside in Colonial Heights, Virginia. And uh, Eloise LeBron, I'll never forget. I was talking to her backstage, beautiful sister with two young girls in the play. And she said, if you want to pursue this thing, you got to become a triple threat. And I was like, what? What's, what's a triple threat? She said, well, you got to learn how to sing, dance, and act. And you know, whether you're great at any or all of them, just learn how to do it so you have another discipline that you can hopefully be employed and build a career on, on top of that. So yeah. I took it seriously and, and uh, ended up going to Carnegie Mellon as a music theater major and, uh, and then went to New York and things started opening up. But, but what guides my decision is, is uh, Whenever I can get on the boards to get back in the theater, I, I try to do that. Um, in terms of any other job, it's like what at, at this point, you know, it's 35, 36 years in, in the game. So what's interesting is not repeating myself and just continuing to stretch and challenge myself in terms of the roles I'm doing. That's fantastic. That, well, you absolutely are doing that. And and what I am getting from each of my guests tonight uh, from Leroy and from Jared and from you is a, is this openness. And, and I, I think that can't be underestimated in terms of being open and knowing and, and being able to be open to what opportunities they are and, and what possibilities there can be, because we don't always know where we're going to be going in terms of this. We just want to be prepared. We want to have as much skills as we can bring at any given time. Um, and I uh, wanted to specifically also ask you, we're celebrating the legacy of black excellence in the arts and, and, and we stand on the shoulders of such great uh, giants uh, such as Mr. Douglas Turner Ward. Uh, but I also know that you have a connection with Ms. Cicely Tyson who hmm. recently passed. Um, and uh, it's interesting sidebar, um, I have been talking with Vanessa Williams the day that uh, Cicely passed. And uh, and she said you had sent her, Vanessa, uh, you had sent Vanessa pictures from Trip to Bountiful. Yeah. This was even before it was announced that she had passed away. You know, it just happened, you just happened to send her those pictures that day. And yeah. I said, as I said, it was almost like Miss Tyson was saying goodbye mm. to you in a way. Um, um, and just sort of giving you a little, a little yeah. thing there. So can you tell us what you can, uh, what it was like to be with her on stage? like tri tri um, to Well, yeah, it, it was uncanny because that morning I just woke up thinking about her for some reason. And I found this picture mm. of, um, of her, 
you know, v Vanessa Williams and Miss Tyson and uh, and Cuba Gooding actually did the production run of the trip to yes. Mount. Yeah, I, I did that role, Cuba's role on tour, and then we did the filmic version of it. Uh, yeah. all time. Um, and I just, you know, she's she's always I've always been in awe of her. I had the great privilege. Oh, yeah, that was opening night in Los Angeles. I, I had the great privilege of playing her son or grandson uh, five different times in my mm -hmm. life. And uh, so when I came to the Bountiful, you know, it was just like a, a shorthand. I used to call her my Hollywood mama. <laughs> <laughs> I was always a son or grandson. Uh, so there was a very much of a shorthand uh, with her. But, you know, she just epitomized grace, elegance, um, uh, gr greatness and and excellence. Um, mm. Yeah, that's uh, was that Mama, uh, Mama Flores family. Yes, yes. Yeah. Was now what was the first thing that you did with uh, uh, Miss Tyson? The first thing was Heat Wave. I think it was 1994. James Earl Jones and oh. Sally Brooklyn and Miss Tyson, where I played a grandson. That's a little, that's a little, my little chubby face with Miss Tyson right there. Oh. <laughs> but you know that picture you just showed there with um, um, Mama Flores family. Uh, Queen Latifah played my daughter in that. Believe yeah. it. And there's Mario Van Peoples as well. And because one of the projects I watched as a child that made me want to become an actor was the autobiography of Miss Jane Pittman. Mm. And her work in that, to watch her as a young woman in her 20s or 30s, age from early 20s to 100 years old with the makeup and just everything she brought forth in the character, mm -hmm. uh, made me want to do that. I said, I want, I want to do what she's doing. And to play that role in Mama Flora's family, where I had a chance to age from 16 to 50 at the end, that last picture you see, alongside her and learn from the at the feet of a master like her was extraordinary. So, so yeah. So later in life, to be able to 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 uh, do Trip to Bountiful on stage with her, and then the, the film the film version of it was just just magical. Wow, that's fantastic. I am. Um, I want to quickly point out to you and um, uh, or bring up to you, I should say, uh, you are a producer as well. And I caught Soul last night, which you were an executive oh. producer on. Uh, it was. Uh, directed, developed by Melissa Hazlip. Um, sure. and, um, and you also did some narrative stuff in there as well. I just watched it last night. It was on. Oh, man. Yeah. on yes. And I was like, oh my goodness, isn't this uncanny? I'm going to be speaking to him tomorrow. And that was just marvelous. Uh, just seeing, seeing all of that. Um, uh, what, what informs your choices as a producer? First of all, say, thank you for saying that. Mr. Soul is a, a documentary that is written, directed, and produced by, as you mentioned, Melissa Hazelip. I want to give her credit because yeah. she's uh, amazing and she's a beast, and she deserved the, cre the credit for telling this story and bring it to the fore. Ellis Hazelip, uh, her uncle, is, of course, the center and the host of, of Soul, the TV show that the documentary is about. You know, what informs what informs my decisions on, on producing is just like it is with acting. Is it mm -hmm. interesting? Is it something compelling? Is it something that's fascinating and something that's new and fresh that the audience hasn't seen? Mm -hmm. When I saw when I saw the final cut that Melissa had done, because I came in and narrated it at the end, I was blown away. First of all, because I didn't I didn't know that story of the show Soul. I had not heard of the show Soul. Um, as I, I assume you too, Darius. A lot of us. Yeah, I you know, and it's funny because I'm I'm one of those people like what Jared was talking about. I watched stuff late at night growing yeah. up. I, Growing up in the seventies and everything, but Soul might have been just a little bit early because you know I was a little bit young for that, so I didn't I didn't catch Miss yeah. Soul. Nineteen sixty-eight to nineteen seventy-three. Right, right. I, mean, I love you know I'm a history buff. I loved it, but I had not heard of it, so right. I, I couldn't jump fast enough to uh, back to the phone and say, "Melissa, I want to I want to be a part of this. How can, right. how can I be a part of this? You know, and the funny thing about it is that my aunt and uncle had appeared on it. My um, aunt yeah. Romy Bay and my uncle Andy Bay both performed with. Um, Horace Silver, the great yeah, movie. yeah, 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 and uh, and and they did a little flash of Salome up there on the documentary. And I was awesome. like, how do we miss this? How do how do we miss this? But it's it just just beautiful. And thank you for being part of that. Um, wow. I want to bring all the guys back, um, Leroy and Jared, because I want to have a little dialogue while we can. I want to. Say hello. <laughs> we hear me, you. <laughs> yes. Oh, man, we had a good time at Soldiers Play. Yes, that's oh, what gosh. I wanted to bring up. Soldiers yeah. Play to sort of just give the tip of the hat at the end to Mr. Douglas Turner Ward and that legacy and Soldiers Play. Um, 
tell me, tell, tell me just a little bit if you can encapsulate that in like in the one minute we have left of the show. Uh, and Leroy can just say, and I loved it too. <laughs> encapsulate what soldiers play? Yes, please. I'll, I'll be I'll be very quick. It was magical. It's one of those few times in life when you work with a group of people. We had eleven cast members who all of us couldn't wait to come to hit that stage every day. And everybody was slammed every night. Everybody brought their A game. And one of my highlights was actually working with brother Jared Grimes. We call him Grimey Steps. Uh, yes. Social media. Because uh, we had a pretty intense scene at the end. But it was just phenomenal and just grateful to have had, had a chance to be a part of it. Yes, I think we have a picture of you, uh, of, of you all. Um, maybe the two of you, you being... Uh, Blair interrogating oh, Jared on Soldier's Play. Yes, Ooh. right there. Yeah, it looks like Jared oh, is a little nervous there. <laughs> we broke down crying all the time. I get nervous out. thinking about that. <laughs> <laughs> that is funny. Well, I was just informed by the producer. I actually have more time than I than I thought. I thought we were going to be crunching this. So good. I can, if if it's okay, if I can ask you all maybe one or two more questions, yeah. we can yeah. toss it, bring it around bring it around the group because I brought up in the um, sound check um, Ava Duver DuVernay's initiative called the, the Array Initiative, which is a database of more diverse, equitable space with crews and creatives of color, uh, more women in, in, in creative positions on set. And I know, Blair, you have worked with Miss DuVernay on uh, We... When they see us. When they see us. I, I, we know, we, I was going to say we are who we are. When they see us. Um, and I wanted to just toss out to all of you who have now all worked in film and TV as well as on stage. Uh, what do you think Broadway theater or theater in general in this time of stasis can cull from Hollywood in any way in terms of how they are implementing these things? Now, of course, Miss DuVernay took it upon herself to implement this. But what what do you think uh, Broadway could uh, learn from these from these actions? You asking me? I'm um, okay. asking you and then I'm gonna bring it, take it around, take it around the room. Well, first of all, Ava is a, is a dear friend and, and is a phenomenal human being and entrepreneur, as we know. Um, she, because she's an entrepreneur and she's a businesswoman, she knows ultimately it's about the dollar. So not unlike uh, when Douglas Turner Ward in 1966 wrote that, that manifesto, the American theater for whites only. Yes. This season, I think all of us signed that letter, the white American theater uh, early on in the pandemic. You know, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. As long as you're making noise, you have to let people know this is what the consumer wants. This is what we feel. It's not just us as artists saying we want to be hired. We want to tell the story. This is what the consumer wants. And because Hollywood, you know, television is used to be free, but, you know, it's a nominal fee for a cable. And now you stream or whatever else. Movies is a, is pales in comparison to what it costs to buy a ticket on Broadway. Mm -hmm. So it's an economic conversation at the end yeah. of the day. So uh, when you can make sure you have that social conversation and do the things that Ava's doing in Hollywood and say, look, listen, listen, like we're doing in, in the Broadway theater community to say white American theater, y'all need to come correct. This is who we are. We need to tell our stories and the audience will eat that up and the audience will embrace that. That's when the two, uh, the two initiatives I think come together. Okay, but it's it's uh, oh, there's my girl. But oh. there, it's um, it's 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 a harder road to hoe, I think, in the theater because of the economics of it all. Yeah, we have to work hard to prove that the audience wants to see this and will embrace this. Right, right, absolutely. Yeah. That was what I say about Broadway in particular is like theater is big, big business. So big business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Um, what? What would you say you are looking forward to immediately in the future? And I would say, let me let me ask you first, uh, Jared. What are you looking forward to immediately for the future? Uh, I'm in theater uh, specifically. Um, I'm looking forward to um, uh, not allowing people to hide behind a closed mind anymore. Um, I, I think that that's some, everybody can say, oops, well, I didn't mean it like that. And, you know, that's just not acceptable anymore. Um, you know, we, we have to hold actions that, you know, um, prevent, um, diversity. Uh, we have to hold those, things, oops, you didn't mean to do it or you didn't see it that way or not. Um, and I feel like once we do that, um, 
that kind of club, because it's really like a club in theater. Um, and it's a very tight knit club. Um, and I think once we start to bodies, um, some other tones, some other hues, some other uh, genders, um, you know, more so into the club, um, or not even into the club, if we break that club up and make it more of a community, um, mm -hmm. then this exclusive club, then I feel like a lot of things will change. And uh, the road to oops will no longer really exist because before you can get to oops, <laughs> it'll already be, you know, addressed. It'll already be, you know, right there in front of your face. There, there'll be those roadblocks immediately as opposed to, as to just saying oops and then you're too far in to even do anything about it. I think that's really, you know, what needs to uh, happen, move forward. And I look forward to that actually um, happening, moving forward. Um, I just, I mean, I've heard oops so many times in so many different ways. So many, there have been so many people who have just kind of, you know, well, okay, well, you know, given a pass for that oops. And I'm just like, you know, now I'm moving forward, you know, let's, let's do something before we get it to that point. Absolutely. Yeah. Leroy, do you have a thought on that? Yeah. I mean, the thing I, I've picked up the most, and I've, I, I echoed it before, is this the term community, right? We've, we've, I think we've all talked about it. And I think, I think the time for cosmetic changes, that's, that's done, right? I, you could feel something very palpable happen this summer, right? Um, where it's, the train has left the station. This is not, I, I, don't, I don't see us letting our, our, our feet off the pedal at all. And so I'm excited about seeing people being held to task, right? For accountability. Exactly, for there to be a, a consistent um, a consistent checking of the powers that be, right? I think we have, we've internalized this, this stuff for too long as, as black artists, we're, whether we're working on stage or whether we're working in front of the camera, there are just certain things, right, that we took for granted or we took to just be, well, that's just the way that, that the, the business is, right? Certain things that we have yeah. to put up with, those oops moments those moments of, of the community out of the community not being reflected right on on that stage. And I can't tell you how many times I remember when I first came into drama school and I'd you know be working in all these different regional theaters, one of the restraint the, the refrains I'd hear over and over again is, oh, that that August Wolfson play broke box office records. Or this play by, you know, by a black woman, this Al Alice Childress play broke box office records. So for me, in my the back of my mind, it's like, well, if it is, if it these are big money generators, why you just, why is it just in February, right? Why we just, right? But like that's that's the time, right? If, if you if you if you're uh, if you're black and you're in the theater and you're not working in February, right? People will be like, what are you doing wrong, right? Because that was always the slot they put the one play in, and that mm -hmm. one play would usually always break the box office record. So. Mm -hmm. If, if, if you're talking about economics, it's, it's, it's a no brainer. You know, you, you diversify, you show, you show on your stage, you show in your productions, in your movies and your, in your TV programs, you show the community um, at large, right? You show us for all of our beauty, all of our complexity, all of our hues. And if, if you want a viable, sustainable model, whether it is the theater, whether it is television and film, you better get hip to it and, and really, and don't just play this this movement lip service, right? I just don't. I just don't. I don't think you put the genie back in the bottle. Yeah, yeah. Well, I I've been saying to people, I said, well, you know, and when I hear that, well, we, you know, I can't wait to go back to what it was. I said, well, it can't go back to what it was. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no going back no, to yeah, not, what it was because there are a lot of things that were wrong with what it was. So we, you know, we have to move forward and honor honor this time. Um, Blair, what do you, what is your thought on that? Uh, I co-sign with the brothers you just said. Yeah. I, really, I really do because uh, no, you <laughs> yeah, the toothpaste can't go back in the in the tube. So <laughs> no, <laughs> no. And, you know, it's 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 this beautiful thing. I'm thinking about just this format, the fact that Seth and James have built this format, this platform during the pandemic, and uh, to allow you, Darius, and allow us to be here and talk about Black Theater United and and talk about what's real and what's happening. You know, people are listening. And Absolutely. This is the moment. And this is yeah. the moment to not turn back. 
Yeah, I, I, it, it, it's been wonderful. And, and again, I thank you very much, Blair, for bringing up Seth and James for creating this form in which, and, and for being so generous to yeah. Black Theatre United for letting us take it over for this month and to celebrate us. Um, for me, the genesis of this particular show went through a few iterations and it has been a great lesson in sort of, I was like, well, you know, if this doesn't work out, then something else will work out. If this doesn't work out, then something else will work out. And, and I tell you the way that this has come into fruition has been so beautiful. I mean, Leroy being here was just for me talking on the phone with him. Um, Jared, uh, me calling him saying, look, could you, could you do this for me because I want to hear your voice. And I was surprised that Jared had not been on the show before. I was like, that ain't right. That ain't right. <laughs> and so I was just like, what's that about? And then, I'm here, Blair, I'm here. Blair, <laughs> and then Blair here, and here's the thing, you know, Blair actually, if, if correct me if I'm wrong, you had reached out to Stars in the House uh, uh, initially to want to talk about uh, Ms. Tyson. Um, uh, I, I, I don't know exactly how 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 it all you know, but it just like it's like you were there, and I was like, yes, please, yeah. <laughs> please, please come talk to me, come talk to me, because I've only met uh, Blair twice before. I, I met you at ART um, when oh. I was doing the show called Best of Both Worlds uh -huh. in, in uh -huh. Cambridge, man, and I was playing the king, and uh, and there was another gentleman. Um, uh, playing the king, and I think people were like, "I was like, is Blair gonna come and take your job?" <laughs> <laughs> I said, like, "Well, he certainly could because he, he is kingly." We <laughs> 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 came in there, and then of course I came to see you and Jared in Soldiers Play, and got to come backstage, and 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 also talk with a. Uh, David Allen Greer, who had been in the original hey. production. And the film. Mm -hmm. And in the film as well. Yeah. So it was just such a such such a great, great uh coming coming together moment. Well, gentlemen. Can I say something real quick? Yes. I just want to thank you. What a what a grimy steps. I want to thank you, Darius and Leroy, because my mother recently passed away October 28th. But I say that not to make anybody sad. Mm. Um, 84 years old, but I would tell you this, that she lived 84 years. She had multiple sclerosis. She was in a wheelchair the last 20 years. Her last hurrah, her last big outing was opening night of a soldier's play on Broadway. Oh. Up on stage. She's one of the people on Broadway and theater and all that. She had a son up on stage, but her highlight of the night was meeting Tony Shalhoub from the Marvelous <laughs> <laughs> her favorite show. So I want to thank you both for your work and the marvelous Mrs. Maisel because you you just lifted her spirit and life every time she came on and love that shy character as well. So yeah, oh, well, 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 I I have to say you know and and maybe you know I don't want to speak for Leroy as well, but I I think there's something very 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 wonderful about being part of something that so many people love and that yeah. reaches out you know it transcends so many you know transcends so many different things and and uh it's 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 just been a real blessing to be part of that show mm -hmm. uh and to work with Leroy and and to really honor his process and and to figure out a process together and 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 really create that that character it, it it truly was truly was something unexpected for me um and it 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 really just ended up being a surprise on so many yeah. different levels so i'm i'm just very honored to be part of that as i am honored to have all of you be part of this show you made this show fire. You made this show beautiful. You made this show informative. You made this show lifted. I cannot thank you enough, Jared Grimes. I cannot thank you enough, Leroy McLean. I cannot thank you enough, my friend Blair Underwood. Um, I cannot thank you, Seth, enough. Thank you, Seth Rudetsky, James Wesley, for giving Black Theater United, which you can still donate to through Stars in the House. You see it there on the bottom. Um, 
this is our last takeover. And I wanted to go out with a bang. And I think, I think hey, hopefully hey. Thank you, Aaron Hartley, <laughs> for working with me and getting all these wonderful images. And, and to all the people who came before us, all the people whose shoulders we stand on, we thank you. We thank you, Douglas Turner Ward, for mm. giving voice to Black people in a way that we really needed. We we carry on that legacy. We honor your legacy, uh, Ashe. Ashe. And uh, Ashe. thank, you. thank you all so much. Thank you for joining us. Um, and um, come back to see Stars in the House when Seth and James will be back in the host chair. Thank you, everybody. All right, guys. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. Good job.